somebody wants to be in movies who can buy their life and say, uh, I, uh, you know, we'll do two movies of your life for that year, or three or four or five, depending on how interesting that person is. If their life is interesting enough, they can go on forever. In 65, at the Silver Factory, the tempo took a change when Edie Sedgwick came in from Boston with her Harvard clique and to be the new girl of the year. Jane Holzer was really the first girl of the year, and she got coverage about that. But Edie came in at like this angel out of a cloud of blue, just with the lightning strikes around. She was so poised, such a director and actress at the same time. She had this poise of complete composure. And when she walked into a room, everyone was on point. I think it's sheer beauty. She has sort of a gamine look, very long legs, very pale face, very pale lips, and a waif in a way. Time sort of stopped when you were with her. I think she may have been the very first of the, of the great superstars. And she came to New York, and Andy Warhol took a look at her at this Lester Persky party, fell in love with her. Of all the superstars drawn into the orbit of Andy Warhol's career, None would match the brilliance with which Edie Sedgwick blazed across the firmament of the factory in 1965. From the very start, the ravishingly beautiful, deeply troubled 22-year-old heiress held a special fascination for Warhol, with her pale good looks, aristocratic pedigree, and restless, drop-dead charm. With a deeply addictive personality and family shadows that included a predatory father and two brothers who had killed themselves less than 10 months apart, the year before. Sedgwick had more problems than anyone I had ever met, Warhol said. Gerard Malanga called her the personification of the poor little rich girl. She was an enchanting uh, creature. I helped do a book on her, really to find out why at the age of 28 she died. The girl with everything on her way, this amazing beauty, very gifted in a funny way. An artist, could have been a good actress, I think. But then she got tied up with Warhol, and of course for Warhol it was a great thing to have this creature to take around. She sort of became at his side all the time. They went to parties together. What happened when he met Edie Sedgwick was that he saw her as his ticket to Hollywood. That was very clear. And he wanted me to write scripts that more and more were Hollywood films to show off her talent so he would be bought by Hollywood and make Hollywood movies. His only dream that he was never to fulfill. Oh, wow. Great. Their first film effort together, a one-character piece starring Edie as herself, was called Poor Little Rich Girl. Though half the film was out of focus, Edie's charisma shone through anyway and her career as an underground film star was launched. For their next project, Warhol asked Tavelle to write a new script for Edie. Something in a kitchen, he said. Something white and clean and plastic. The result was Kitchen. In the film, Edie and her mostly male co-stars drift around the pristine kitchen of a studio apartment, chattering all but inaudibly, thanks to the poor quality of the sound. It ends when one of her co-stars, for no apparent reason, strangles her on the kitchen table while the rest of the party look on. In what would prove to be in many ways her best film, Beauty Number 2, Cedric could be seen sprawling nearly naked on a bed with a handsome young man, while from the darkness off camera, an unseen man lays siege to her with a series of increasingly personal and hostile questions. What do you mean? Well, you can ask me what I mean for. You know damn well what I mean. I don't know what you mean. What do you mean? Why would I say what do you mean if I knew what you mean? Yeah, mind, it was a, uh, electric. And um, the extraordinary thing about the film was that there was the third actor, this sort of voyeur figure, very much in a way like Andy, you know, the voyeur watching these two beautiful people on this bed, this boy and this girl. And she was very much drawn by him but also drawn by these terrifying questions being put to her by the man in the foreground, Chuck Wine, his name was. And they were very personal questions. How did that sound, Edie? 
I'll wake you up tomorrow. We'll find another doctor. You can read. Beauty number two, in many ways, was the high point of Edie Sedgwick's career. By the time it premiered on July 17, 1965, to glowing reviews that certified her status as the queen of underground film in New York, her relationship with Warhol had already begun to sour. She often talked about trying to get close to Andy, a mutual friend reported, but she never could get close to him on an emotional level. Money too became an issue. Though the film seldom made a profit and had to be subsidized by the sale of Warhol's paintings, Edie grew increasingly resentful of his refusal to pay her for her work. Egged down by her friends, including Bob Dylan's right-hand man, Bobby Newworth, with whom she would soon start a passionate affair. It was the beginning of a bitter tug of war between the Warhol and Dylan camps, which was still going on the day Dylan himself sat for two tense screen tests at the factory, six months later. By then, Edie herself had started the long spiral down into darkness and drug abuse that would end with her death five years later. By the time I came along, she had come back from Woodstock, a heroin addict, and there wasn't much you could do with her. And I think Andy knew that too, and that it was the beginning of the end. Many dreams were dying for him, and he'd keep trying with her, but he knew she wasn't going to take him to Hollywood. And in fact, every day she was heavier and heavier into drugs, so she couldn't, aside from not making lines work, couldn't remember anything anymore. When Edie Sedgwick started going into the outer darkness, Andy Warhol did not try and bring her back. Or if he did, it was a pretty uh, ineffective gesture. So that's a factor that one must weigh along with the greatness and the brilliance and the talent and all the rest. His, I have to say it, his responsibility to these people who came into his world. Edie Sedgwick, because she came from a socially prominent family, ended up not dying in the streets exactly, but dying terribly at the age of 28. 28. That's just the beginning of life for most people. She looked like this bedraggled, wretched has-been at the age of 28. It was horrifying. It was sickening what happened. It was sickening what happened to a large number of people who were wrapped up in that dream. And a lot of people had their hearts broken forever.